Avlograd Regiment of Hussars was encamped two miles from Brnau. The squadron in which Nikolai Rostov served as Yunker was quartered in the German village of Salzenek. The squadron commander, Captain Denisov, who was known to the entire cavalry division as Vaska Denisov, had been assigned to the best house in the village. Yunker Rostov had shared the captain's quarters ever since he joined the regiment in Poland. On the very same October day, when at headquarters all had been thrown into excitement by the news of Mac's defeat, the camp life of the squadron was going on in its usual tranquil course. Denisov, who had been playing a losing game of cards all night long, had not yet returned to his rooms, when Rostov, early in the morning, rode up on horseback from his foraging tour. He was in his younger uniform, and, as he galloped up to the doorstep and threw his leg over with the agile dexterity of youth, he paused a moment in the stirrup, as though sorry to dismount but at last sprang lightly from the horse and called the orderly. "'Hey, Bondarenko, my dear fellow,' he shouted to the hussar, who hurried forth to attend to the horse. "'Lead him about a little, my friend,' said he, with that fraternal geniality with which handsome young men are apt to treat everybody when they are happy. "'I will, your illustriousness,' replied the little Russian, gaily shaking his head. "'See that you walk him about well,' Another hussar also hastened up to attend to the horse, but Bondarenko had already taken the bridle. It was evident that the yunker gave handsome fees, and that it was a pleasure to serve him. Rostov smoothed the horse's neck, then his flank, and turned and looked back from the step. "'Excellent! He'll be a horse worth having,' said he to himself. And then smiling, and picking up his sabre, he mounted the steps with clinking spurs." The German who owned the house glanced up as he worked in his shirt-sleeves and nightcap, pitching over manure in the cowhouse. The German's face always lighted at the sight of Rostov. He gaily smiled and winked. "'Good morning, good morning,' he reiterated, evidently taking great satisfaction in giving the young man his morning greeting. "'Busy already, schön fleißig? asked Rostov, with the same good-natured, friendly smile which so well became his animated face. Hurrah for the Austrians! Hurrah for Russians! Hurrah for the Kaiser Alexander! he shouted, repeating the words which his German host was fond of saying. The German laughed, came out from the door of the cowhouse, took off his nightcap, and waving it over his head, cried, Hurrah for the whole world! Und die ganze Welt hoch! Rostov, following the German's example, waved his forage cap around his head, and with a merry laugh shouted, Und vivant die ganze Welt! Long live the whole world! Although there was no special reason for rejoicing, either on the part of the German who was engaged in pitching manure, or for Rostov, who had been on a long ride with his men after hay, nevertheless both men looked at each other with joyous enthusiasm and brotherly love, nodded their heads to show that they understood each other, and then separated with a smile, the German to his cow-house, and Rostov to the cottage which he and Denisov shared together. "'Where's the baron?' he asked of Luvroshka, Denisov's rascally valet, who was known to the whole regiment. "'He hasn't been in since evening, probably been losing at cards,' replied Lavrushka. "'I have learned that if he has good luck, he comes in early and in high spirits,' But if he does not get in before morning, it means he's been losing, and he'll come in mad enough. Will you have coffee? Yes, give me some. In less than ten minutes, Lavrushka brought the coffee. He's coming, he said. Now we'll get it. Rostov glanced out the window and saw Denisov meandering home. He was a little man, with a red face, brilliant black eyes, and dark moustache, and hair all in disorder. He wore a hussar's pelisse unbuttoned, wide, sagging pantaloons, and a hussar's cap on the back of his head. He came up the steps in a gloomy mood, with hanging head. Lavushka, he cried in a loud, surly voice, "'Here, you blockhead, take this off!' "'Don't you see I am taking it off?' replied Lavrushka's voice. "'Ah, you up already?' asked Denisov, as he came into the cottage." "'Long ago,' replied Rostov, 
I've been after Hay, and I saw Fraulein Matilda. So, ho, and there I have been, brother, losing horribly all night, like a son of a dog, cried Denison, slurring over his R's. Such horrid bad luck, perfectly horrid. The moment you left, luck changed. Hey, tea. Denisov snarled with a sort of smile that showed his short, sound teeth, and began to run the short fingers of both hands through his thick, black hair that stood up like a forest. The devil himself dwove me to that what, the officer's nickname was the rat, said he, rubbing his forehead and face with both hands. Just imagine, didn't have a single cod, not one, not a single one. Denisov took out the pipe which he had been smoking, knocked the ashes into his palm, and scattering the fire, laid it upon the floor, and went on shouting. Simple stakes, lose the doubles, simple stakes, lose the doubles. After he had scattered the fire, he broke his pipe in two and flung it away. Then, after a silence, he suddenly looked up at Rostov, with his bright black eyes full of merriment. If there were only some women here, but here there's nothing to do but dwink. If we could only have a wound of fighting. He, who's there? he cried, going to the door, on hearing the sound of heavy boots and the jingling of spurs in the next room. The quartermaster, announced Lavrushka. Denisov frowned still more portentously. Twat it, he exclaimed, flinging his friend a purse containing a few gold pieces. Wistov, count it, chicken. See how much is left, then hide it under my pillow, said he, and went out to see the quartermaster. Rostov took the money, and mechanically making little heaps of the new and old coins, according to their denominations, began to count them. Ah, tell ye nin, how do ye? Got done up last night, Denisov was heard saying in the next room. Where? At Brukov's, at the Rats. I heard about it, said a second, thin voice, and immediately after, Lieutenant Telyanin, a young officer of the same squadron, came into the room. Rostov thrust the purse under the pillow and pressed the little moist hand that was held out to him. Telyanin had been removed from the guards shortly before the campaign, for some reason or other. He now conducted himself very decently in the regiment, but he was not liked, and Rostov, especially, could not conquer or even conceal his unreasonable antipathy to this officer. Well, young cavalier, how does my Grachek suit you? Grachek, or young Rook, was a saddle horse that Telyanin had sold Rostov. The lieutenant never looked the man with whom he was talking straight in the eye. His eyes were constantly wandering from one object to another. I saw you riding him this morning. First rate. He's a good horse, said Rostov, in spite of the fact that the animal for which he had given seven hundred roubles was worth half the price he had paid. He's begun to go lame in the front foreleg. Hoof cracked. That's nothing. I will teach you or show you what kind of a rivet to put on. Yes, show me, please, said Rostov. I will show you, certainly I will. It's no secret, and you will thank me for the horse. I'll have him brought right round, said Rostov, anxious to get rid of Telyanin, and he went out to give his orders. In the entry, Denisov, with a pipe in his mouth, was sitting cross-legged on the threshold in front of the quartermaster, who was making his report. When he saw Rostov, Denisov made a face and, pointing with his thumb over his shoulder into the room where Telyanin was, scowled still more darkly, and shuddered with aversion. Ugh! I don't like that young fellow, said he, undeterred by the quartermaster's presence. Rostov shrugged his shoulders, as much as to say, nor I either, but what is to be done about it, and having given his orders, returned to Telyanin. The latter was still sitting in the same indolent position in which Rostov had left him, rubbing his small, white hands. What repugnant people one has to meet, said Rostov to himself, as he went into the room. Well, did you order the horse brought round? asked Telyanin, getting up and carelessly looking around. I did. Come on, then. I just ran over to ask Denisov about today's orders. That was all. Have they come in yet, Denisov? Not yet. 
"'Where are you going?' "'Oh, I'm just going to show this young man how to shoe his horse,' replied Telyanin. They went out down the front steps to the stable. The lieutenant showed Rostov how to make a rivet, and then went home. When Rostov returned, he found Denisov sitting at the table with a bottle of vodka and a sausage before him, and writing with a sputtering pen. He looked gloomily into Rostov's face. "'I'm writing to her,' said he. He leaned his elbow on the table with the pen in his hand, and told to his friend what his letter was to be, evidently taking real delight in the chance of saying faster than he could write all that he had in his mind to put on the paper. "'Do you see, my friend?' said he. "'We are asleep when we are not in love. We are children of the dust. But when you are in love, then you are like God. You are as pure as on the first day of creation.' "'Who is there? Send him to the devil. I have no time,' he cried to Lavrushka, who came up to him, not in the least abashed. "'What can I do? It's your own order. It's the quartermaster come back for the money.' Denisov scowled, opened his mouth to shout something, but made no sound. "'Nasty job,' he muttered to himself. "'How much money was there left in that purse?' he asked Rostov. Seven new pieces and three old ones. Ach, dwat it! Well, what are you standing there for, like a booby? Fetch in the quartermaster, cried Denisov to Lavrushka. Please, Denisov, take some of my money. You see I have plenty, said Rostov, reddening. I don't like to bow on my friends. I don't like it, declared Denisov. But if you don't let me lend you money, comrade fashion, I shall be offended, insisted Rostov. "'Truly, I have plenty.' "'No, indeed, I shan't.' And Denisov went to the bed to get the purse from under the pillow. "'Where did you put it? Wostov?' "'Under the bottom pillow.' "'It isn't there.' Denisov flung both pillows on the floor. There was no purse there. "'That's strange. "'Hold on. "'Didn't you throw it out?' asked Rostov, picking up the pillows and shaking them, and then hauling off the bedclothes and shaking them. But there was no purse. I could not have forgotten it, could I? No. I remember very well thinking how you kept it like a treasure trove under your pillow. Where is it? he demanded to Lavrushka. I haven't been into the room. It must be where you put it. But it isn't. That is always the way with you. You throw it down and then forget all about it. Look in your pockets. No. If I had not thought about the treasure trove, said Rostov, and I remember putting it there. Lavrushka tore the whole bed apart, looked under it, under the table, searched everywhere in the room, and then stood still in the middle of the room. Denisov silently followed all his motions, and when Lavrushka, in amazement, spread open his hands, he glanced at Rostov. Rostov, stop your schoolboy twix. Rostov, Conscious of Denisov's gaze fixed upon him, raised his eyes and instantly dropped them again. The blood, till then contained somewhere below his throat, rushed in an overmastering flood into his face and eyes. He could not get a breath. There has been no one in the room except the lieutenant and yourselves. It is nowhere to be found, said Lavrushka. Now you devil's puppet, fly round, hunt for it, suddenly cried Denisov, growing livid and starting toward the valet with a threatening gesture. "'Find me that purse, or I'll horsewhip you. I'll horsewhip you all.' Rostov, avoiding Denisov's glance, began to button up his jacket, adjusted his saber, and put on his cap. "'I tell you, give me that purse,' cried Denisov, shaking his man by the shoulders and pushing him against the wall. "'Denisov, let him go. I know who took it,' said Rostov, going toward the door and not lifting his eyes. Denisov paused, considered a moment, and evidently, perceiving whom Rostov meant, seized him by the arm. Wubbish! he cried, the veins on his face and neck standing out like cords. I tell you, you are beside yourself, and I won't have it. The purse is here. I'll take the hide off this wascal, and I'll get it. I know who took it, repeated Rostov, in a trembling voice, and went to the door. "'But I tell you, don't you dare to do it!' cried Denisov, 
throwing himself on the yunker to hold him back. But Rostov freed his arm, and with as much anger as though Denisov were his worst enemy, gave him a direct and heavy blow right between the eyes. "'Do you realize what you are saying?' he cried, in a trembling voice. "'He is the only person beside myself who has been in the room. Of course, if it was not he, then—' He could not finish, and rushed from the room. "'Ah, the devil take you in all the West!' were the last words that Rostov caught. He went straight to Telyanin's rooms— "'My baron's not at home. He went to headquarters,' said Telyanin's man. "'Why, has anything happened?' he added, surprised at the younger's distorted face. "'No, nothing. You just missed him,' said the man. Headquarters were three versts from Salzanek. Rostov, without returning home, took a horse and galloped off to headquarters. In the village occupied by the staff was a tavern where the officers resorted. Rostov went to this tavern. At the doorsteps he saw Telyanin's horse. The lieutenant himself was sitting in the second room of the tavern with a plate of sausages and a bottle of wine. "'Ah, so you have come too, young man,' said he, smiling and lifting his brows. "'Yes,' said Rostov, though it required the greatest effort to speak this monosyllable. And he took his seat at the next table. Neither said more. Two Germans and a Russian officer were the other occupants of the room. No one was talking, and the only sounds were the rattle of knives and forks, and the lieutenant's munching. When Telyanin had finished his breakfast, he pulled out of his pocket a double purse, and with his delicate white fingers, which turned up at the ends, slipped up the ring, took out a gold piece, and lifting his brows, gave it to the waiter. "'Please make haste,' said he. The gold piece was new. Rostov got up and went to Telyanin. "'Allow me to look at your purse,' he said, in a quiet, almost inaudible voice. With wandering eyes and still lifted brows, Telyanin handed him the purse. "'Yes, it's a handsome little purse, isn't it?' "'Yes,' said he, and suddenly turned pale. "'Look at it, youngster,' he added. Rostov took the purse into his hand and looked at it, and at the money that was in it, and at Telyanin. The lieutenant glanced around in his usual way, and apparently became suddenly very merry. If we ever get to Vienna, I shall leave all this there, but there's nothing to get with it in these filthy little towns, said he. Will you give it back to me, youngster? I must be going. Rostov said nothing. And you? Aren't you going to have some breakfast? Pretty good fare, continued Telyanin. "'Give it to me.' He stretched out his hand and took hold of the purse. Rostov let it go. Telyanin took the purse and began to let it slip into the pocket of his riding trousers, and his brows went up higher than usual, and his mouth slightly parted as much as to say, "'Yes, yes, I will put my purse in my pocket, and it is a very simple matter, and it is no one's business at all.' "'Well, what is it, youngster?' said he, sighing and glancing into Rostov's eyes from under his raised eyebrows. Something like a swift electric flash darted from Telyanin's eyes into Rostov's, and was darted back again, and again, and again, all in a single instant. "'Come here with me,' said Rostov, taking Telyanin by the arm. He drew him almost to the window. "'This money is Denisov's. You took it,' he whispered in his ear. "'What? What?' "'How do you dare?' "'What?' exclaimed Telyanin. But his words sounded like a mournful cry of despair and a prayer for forgiveness. As soon as Rostov heard this note in his voice, it seemed as though a great stone of doubt had fallen from his heart. He was rejoiced and at the same time felt sincere pity for the unhappy man standing before him. But he was obliged to carry the matter to the end. "'There are men here. God knows what they will think.' stammered Telyanin, seizing his cap and starting for a small, unoccupied room. We must have an explanation. I know this and can prove it, said Rostov. I... All the muscles of Telyanin's scared, pale face began to tremble. His eyes kept wandering, though they were fixed on the floor, and never once raised to Rostov's, and something like a sob was heard. Count! Don't ruin a young fellow! 
"'Here's that wretched money. Take it,' he threw it on the table. "'I have a father who is an old man. I have a mother.' Rostov took the money, avoiding Telyanin's gaze, and, not saying a word, started to leave the room. But at the door he paused and turned back. "'My God!' said he, with tears in his eyes. "'How could you have done it?' "'Count,' said Telyanin, coming towards the younger. "'Don't touch me!' cried Rostov, drawing himself up. "'If you need this money, take it.' He tossed him the purse and hurried out of the tavern. End of chapter 4